Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Taylor, and uh, this afternoon, um, to wrap things up, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, using Freebase and Mikkel. Um, this is um, a talk which is really f sort of trying to move your use of Mikkel ahead, um, some advanced sort of techniques. And um, I know that not everybody here is probably um, completely versed in Mikkel and as facile as uh, some people. So I thought it would be useful to actually do a little bit of a level set um, to make sure that everybody was sort of thinking about things the same way and everybody was familiar with the syntax and some of the capabilities of the query language. So we'll start by talking a little bit about Freebase, um, understanding how Mikkel uh, works, uh, some of the different forms that it takes. And then we're going to push ahead and really look quite closely at how links are actually formed and all of the metadata around links um, in Freebase. And that's really going to be sort of the heart of the power in um, this talk. And given what we've learned about uh, how links are actually represented in Freebase, this really suggests a different way of conceptualizing your programming model um, when you're working with Freebase data. And so we'll talk a little bit about what I call property-driven programming. And then finally, to wind up, um, we'll talk about metaschema, which is a fairly new concept um, in Freebase. Uh, and the idea is that you can actually get more power by rolling things together. So with that, um, I should point out that um, I would really love if you have feedback about this talk, uh, to use the short link. Um, I'll have these available uh, at the end of the talk as well, um, and hashtags that people are using uh, when they're in their social networks. Um, I should also say that um, the slides may not be sort of as easily viewable, but um, at the end I'll give you a URL uh, that actually takes you to an Acre application where all of the queries are available and you can actually explore them and edit them yourselves so you don't have to worry about taking notes and things like that. So uh, let's start by talking a little bit about Freebase. Uh, so you're probably aware that Freebase is a giant graph of entities. Um, so here we're looking at the neighborhood around uh, Jane Austen. Um, she was an author who was born in a town in Eng England and uh, wrote a couple of books, and she's influenced a few people uh, over her lifetime. Um, what's unique about Freebase is that all of these links between these entities are actually labeled so that we can actually tell you what type of relationship they have uh, with one another. And this graph is fairly large. Uh, so right now there are over 22 million topics in Freebase, these are the entities, uh, and over 400 million connections between those 20 million, 22 million uh, entities. Everything in Freebase is available under a Creative Commons attribution license, so you're free to use it in any way that you see fit, uh, as long as you give credit back to where the data came from. What's, I find very interesting about Freebase as well, and this is really where the, the community contribution part, I think, kicks in in a very interesting way, uh, is that Freebase is a very rich uh, source of vocabulary, that is, for ways of actually talking about entities. So here I've just um, created a simple graph where I've um, ranked the instances um, that use types, types being sort of collections of attributes, and looked at all of these types that had more than 10 entity instances. And you can see that we have over 6,000 different types that you can draw from. Uh, over 1,700 of these are in what we call the commons. Um, that's an area that's fairly well protected, um, community managed and curated. Um, these are the vocabularies that you can really depend on. And then we've got uh, over 4,000 that are in what we call bases. Uh, these are areas where individuals or small communities are coming together and actually developing a vocabulary. So there's a very rich source um, of ways of talking about the entities that's available to you. So that we're all using the same terminology and so everybody's clear, uh, topics are things that, um, uh, are, are topics are objects that represent things in the real world. Um, so for instance, um, we have a topic that represents a person, Jane Austen. Um, we have topics that represent places, uh, Seventon, where the, she was born. Uh, and we have topics that represent other things in the world, for instance, uh, Darcy, one of her characters, um, other things like planets and iPods and things like that as well. Uh, what's unique about Freebase is that all of these uh, topics 
have strong identifiers. That is, there's a unique uh, and dependable way that you can actually reference uh, these objects by using these identifiers. But it's important to keep in mind that objects, while they have IDs, the IDs are not actually their names. Names are actually attributes on these objects. So that leads us to properties, the relationships between these objects. And you can see that uh, Jane, Aud Jane Austen influenced Henry James, and Henry James was influenced by Jane Austen. Um, these links are bi-directional, but it's important to understand that the links can have unique names in each direction. And finally, this is really a, a very subtle thing when you're looking at a graph of entities. It's the properties that are actually creating the meaning. When you, you know, think about the object that represents Jane Austen, there's nothing intrinsic about that object that tells you anything about Jane Austen. It's the relationships that that object has with other things in the graph. For instance, the fact that there's a link called place of birth, a property called place of birth that leads you to another object, which is Seventon. And the fact that there's a date of birth that uh, leads you to a literal, which is 1775. And the fact that she actually has a name, which is her label. These are the things that actually bestow Jane Austen-ness onto that object. So now that we have sort of uh, a quick understanding of sort of what it is that we're talking about, um, let's press right on into the language. Um, this is Mikkel, the MetaWeb query language, where we can ask this graph of entities questions. We're going to start off um, with a bunch of really simple queries that I think demonstrate the different forms that uh, queries can take. So we're just going to look at the relationship between Jane Austen and her place of birth. So probably the simplest query that we could formulate is to say we're going to start with this object, Jane Austen, and then we're going to look at this property, which is um, ID is uh, people, person, place of birth, and we're going to say null. Um, that is, we want the system to actually fill in that last part. And when we do this and run the query, it comes back with the label Stubbington. So uh, it replaces the null with just the label of the entity at the other end. Now, we can be a little bit more sophisticated, and we can actually say, well, we know that the thing at the other end is an object. And so by using the curly braces, um, we're actually going to ask the system to blow this object out. And what it gives us back is all of the sort of core object properties that are on the other end. So for instance, the fact that it has an ID, that it has a name, um, and this object has a whole bunch of these different types. It's a, a topic, it's a location, it's a city town. I mean, there's a bunch more information than it gives. Being a little bit more sophisticated, we can actually ask a wild card. Um, and the wild card, uh, the star, is going to return us the same information that we got in the last query, plus a bunch more information um, based on the type of object that we should be seeing at the other end of that link. So here it knows that um, place of birth has a location at the other end, and so it's going to give us things like the containment hierarchy, the fact that it's contained by the United Kingdom, it's contained by Hampshire. Um, if, it had, uh, if it were in the United States, it might have a USBG name associated with it. So uh, we can also ask for a very specific property off of this. We would just want the ID of the object at the other end. So here we just get back en Seventon. And in this case, I'm actually going to turn the query around. I'm going to say, I know that you know, some people were born in Seventon. Um, I'm curious as to who they are. <clears throat> and I put this query in square brackets because I know that I'm gonna, going to possibly get a list of people back. And so in fact, it turns out that Jane and her siblings were actually born there. Not terribly surprising. Uh, we can also um, reverse the meaning of the people place of birth uh, property. So here I'm saying, um, I'm starting on Seventon, and I know there's links from other objects that are place of birth, show me what's there. And uh, we use the bang operator in this case to reverse the meaning of the property. And lo and behold, we actually get Jane and her siblings back as well here. So, that's great. That sort of runs us through the different forms that a Meckle query can take, and we'll be using a lot of those different forms uh, as we work through the rest of this uh, talk. Um, but what's really interesting about Freebase is the fact that all of these properties are in a very orderly relationship with one another. This is what we call schema, and this is sort of how to understand what to expect um, as you navigate the graph. 
And so we can start with Jane Austen and we can say, how is it that we actually know that Jane Austen is a person? And furthermore, what makes us think that she actually has this property place of birth? So let's start with the first question. And the first thing to sort of understand is that everything in Freebase is represented as an object. And objects then have a set of properties associated with them. And I don't know that you can necessarily read this, but the idea is that there's a reference that you can go to and you can see all of the properties on uh, type object. And one of the first things that you'll probably use uh, is the type property. So that's great. We know that um, Jane Austen being an object, she's going to have a type property associated with her. And we can actually run a query to find out what's at the other end of that uh, type link. And lo and behold, we discovered that there's another object which has the ID people person. Ah, so this is interesting. This is how it is that we think that Jane Austen is a person. But what's so special about that people person object? Well, it's an object, so it's going to have a type link, and we can run a query there to find out what it's connected to. And what we discover is at the other end, there's another object called type type. Okay, so that's great. We have another object there. Super, let's play this game out a little bit further. Let's run that query again. And what's special about type type is that type type is actually connected to itself. So this sort of completes the circuit, right? We actually now understand how it is that people person became a type and how it is then that Jane Austen becomes a person by being connected to that object. So that's cool. You know, we have some basic understanding of sort of how the type system comes into being in the graph. Um, but that still doesn't answer this, this latter question, which is um, how is it that we think that she actually has a property called place of birth? Well, to do that, we probably have to look a little bit closer at this interesting uh, type called type. Uh, one of the things to notice is that types have properties. So let's go back to our graph. Um, this is the same triad that we were just exploring. Uh, and we know that there's another type out there called property. So that's great. Um, we know that this object, which is type property, is actually connected to type type, just like person is. Cool. Um, and we know that this type has properties. And one of those properties is uh, a thing called expected type. So now we actually have a property on property which is the expected type. Awesome. You can see how this is playing out. So now we can actually go and construct a um, place of birth property. We connect it up because it's of type property. And we're going to make it a property of people person. And it actually has an expected type of location. And you can see how this is all interconnected. So this is great. We actually have now an understanding of both how types in the system come into being and also how properties are represented in the system and how they're connected up to their types. And what's really fun about this is that all of this is done in the graph. And that means that using our Mickle query capabilities, which we've been building up, we can actually interrogate these structures exactly the same way we've been interrogating uh, Jane Austen. In fact, we can do both at the same time. How much fun is that? So let's play on and sort of interrogate the schema a little bit more. So for this uh, object out there, which is people person, we know that its type is type. Um, and we want to know all of the properties that are on this type. So um, we ask a simple query. We get back a list of all of the properties, including um, place of birth. It happens to also have gender and profession and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so for this place of birth, um, we know that it's a type property. We know that there's a property called expected type, so let's find out what's at the other, uh, what we should expect to be at the other end of these objects. And that tells us that it's a location. So great, so we actually now can interrogate um, that graph structure that we were looking at before. So now we can build up slightly more interesting structures, and this is a structure that we're actually going to refer to again. Um, we're going to say for uh, some type, um, I want all of its properties, and I want to know what the expected type is of those properties. So um, find me all of the types that have properties where the expected type is a location. And what we get back is um, the fact that uh, the location type has a property called contains. The location property also has a property called contained by. 
What's kind of interesting is that this is actually what we call the phylogeny pattern. These are um, properties that expect their own type uh, on the other side, and you can sort of create hierarchies and, and circuits that way. Um, we also get human language back. The region of the human language uh, is a location. Uh, and lo and behold, um, place of birth on people person uh, has an expected type of location as well as a whole bunch of other ones. So great. Now, I told you that uh, properties uh, are bi-directional and that they have different names in each direction. And for the most part, you can just sort of think of properties as being sort of uniform. But it turns out that under the surface, properties actually have a bit of a directionality associated with them, where, where they defined, essentially. Um, and so here, I'm asking for um, the, uh, in the uh, written work type, I want to know about the author property. And I want to know if it's a master or if it's actually just the inverse of uh, another property. And it turns out that when I run this query, I discover that, in fact, um, there is a master property which is defined on author, which is the works written. So this is that link running in the other direction. So the only thing to take away from this is that there is this notion of directionality that's sort of buried under the covers. For the most part, you really don't have to think about it. But when we're going to start playing some of the games that we're going to be talking about a little bit down the road, um, this is actually going to come in very handy. So now that we understand a little bit more about schema, how to interrogate it, uh, let's press on and actually look into connections. Now, going back to that really simple query that we started with, um, where we talk about Jane Austen. This time, we're actually going to look at the languages that she spoke. Uh, I want to find out what uh, languages are at the other end, and what you discover is that um, she actually spoke English. So that's the little representation at the bottom. And what you have to really think about when you write a very simple query like this is that this people-person languages, this property is really representing this link. And what you're doing is you're looking from one object across to another object. But what we don't see is anything about that link itself. So happily, uh, Mikkel actually provides a directive called link that we can insert to actually see into uh, the connection that's being made between these two objects. It's not just that we think that these objects are sort of nearby. We think that there's a link, and we want to know something more about them. Uh, the link directive actually returns uh, objects of type link, and if you look at the properties for type link, you discover that it has things like creator and timestamp, who did this, when did they do it, as well as a whole bunch of other properties, and we're gonna look at those other properties actually in depth here. So um, <laughs> this is the uh, client display of the schema for type link, and this is actually one of my favorite um, type definitions in the whole Freebase system, because I, I think it's just like the ultimate understatement. Used to access the advanced features of Mikkel. Tells you nothing, um, and yet all of this power is hidden away in these different properties. Um, so we're going to explore this actually uh, a, a bit in depth. So these are the properties of type link, and they actually sort of um, form different bundles, which I think of as sort of fulfilling different needs that you might have, depending upon sort of what activity you're engaged in. So this first set, timestamp, creator, operation, and valid, are useful for exploring the history of these links. When were these made? Who did it? Um, and we can actually talk about sort of time. Schema. Um, we can look at the master property and the reverse property, the things that we were looking at before when we were looking at book author. And finally, uh, source target and target value. These are the connections on each end of the link. And this is really useful when we want to reflect on the graph and understand a lot more about the connections. So we'll talk about each one of these sets uh, in depth. So going back to uh, our link directive, we can actually just add in the specific property that we want who was the creator of this link between Jane Austen and the English language, and lo and behold, you discover that it was me. <laughs> um, now we can play out a little bit more of a history uh, game. Um, so starting with Jane Austen, um, we know that she's an object, so she has a bunch of types associated with her. And now we actually want to look at the links between this Jane Austen and the different types that she has. So here, um, I'm opening up the, the link there, 
I'm asking for the timestamp, the operation, whether or not it was an insert or a delete, and whether or not this link is currently valid in the system. And finally, I'm gonna actually sort um, the output based on the timestamp of the link creation so I can see these things in chronological order. And what we get back uh, is actually kind of interesting. We discover that when Jane Austen was added, uh, she was given um, the type common topic, that is, she became a topic, um, and that was in uh, October of 2006, and yes, in fact, it's still true, she is a topic. She's also a, a person um, that was added in November of 2006, and that link is still valid as well. But then we get to this one, which is a little perplexing. It says that she was a film writer. And the only problem is that she was long dead before celluloid was being used to create motion pictures. So it's a little hard to imagine her as being a film writer. Um, happily, we can see that uh, even though this was inserted in November of 2006, um, the link is not currently valid, and if we look further and further down the chronology, we actually discover that, in fact, the film writer type, the, the link to it, was actually deleted uh, in, uh, what, July of 2010. So happily, somebody went in and corrected this, but we can actually see all of this history, and that's because Freebus is really an append-only data store, so we have all of this information about what has happened to these objects over time. So great, uh, that actually sort of takes us through history, and now we can look a little bit more at schema. Um, so starting with Jane Austen and looking at this languages link, we can ask about what is the master property for this link? Um, we can also ask if it's the reverse. And what we get back is, in fact, it's not the reverse, um, that the master property is people, person, languages, and you say, gee, that's really not terribly informative because that's the way I asked the query. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's actually more that we can do here. So for instance, if I were actually sort of building an application, one of the things I might want to do is to say, ah, I can actually open up this link and I can get out the display name of that property as well as learn about the type that I should find at the other end. And I can do that all in this one package. So that's great. I actually get back the fact that the display name for this link is languages. Um, and the thing that I should find at the other end is uh, a human language. Now, the only problem here is that it's a little bit of a cheat. Um, and that's because, in fact, this could have been a reverse property. So here's a query where I'm asking about Ridley Scott, the director of Blade Runner and other like classics. Uh, and I'm gonna look at him as a film director and get back the films that he's connected to. And here I'm asking for the link between Ridley Scott and those films. And I'm gonna get back the master property, the display name, the expected type, and now I'm actually asking for the reverse of that master property. So I'm gonna find out what that property definition is going in the other direction. And I'm gonna get the name and the expected type. And you'll see this reverse null down here um, is actually very important because now when it comes back true, that tells my application that I should actually be looking at this area in green and using that as the information about this link. Make sense? Okay, just to make sure I'm not, you know, pulling the wool over your eyes here. Um, so this is great. So now we can actually formulate sort of meaningful queries. We can get a lot of information back about the links that are in those queries. Um, but, you know, there's this one sort of thing when we're actually exploring the graph, and that is, if I'm just looking at an object, how is it that I can know what queries I should actually be asking? How do I know what things are actually connected to this? Um, and in fact, this is the mechanism that the Freebase client actually uses to display the information about these topics and help you navigate around the graph. So we're gonna look at, uh, again, uh, type link, and the last set here, source, target, and value, to understand how it is that we can reflect on these things. Source target is the idea that these links have a source. They start somewhere and they end in another place. And sometimes that thing that they end on is actually a literal value uh, or a primitive value of some sort. So that's what source target, uh, source target and target value are giving you. So we can formulate a pretty simple query, which is um, we're going to use type link. We want to start with the source of being Jane Austen. We want to get the property that connects Jane Austen to other things, which on the other side are just topics. Cool. 
this is a nice little reflect query. And we can find out that, in fact, she has a master property of place of birth, and that the target is Ian Seventon, uh, and that uh, she has a place of death, which was Winchester, uh, and that she has gender, and she is female, and it goes on and on, all of the things that are connected up to Jane Austen. So that's cool. Um, but there's really more to this story that we need to unpack. And so one of the things when you're exploring uh, Freebase schema, um, and you could go to the client and do this, but since we actually know how to write nickel queries against schema, we can actually write our own. And that is, can we actually find a property that has the expected type of type link on property? And lo and behold, there is, um, happily, a thing called uh, links, which is all of the uses of this property. And uh, now I can say something like, for the property place of birth, I want to get back all of the links that are, uh, all of the connections that are using this property. And the first one I get back actually was made by a guy named Robert. Uh, it was the source of Steve Martin and connecting him to Waco. Uh, and that was done in December of 2006 and it's currently valid. So apparently that's the right thing to say. So this is great, so we actually have a way now of exploring all of the uses of a property. And that's kind of important because in that query that we ran for Jane Austen, the reflect query, where we said that Jane Austen was the source and we wanted to know the target, that tells us this story. It says Jane Austen is connected to Steventon and she's connected to the English language and she's connected to Pride and Prejudice. But what's missing is the fact that actually Henry James is connected to Jane Austen but the connection is going the other direction. Jane Austen is the target of that connection. She's not the source. So that's simple enough to fix. We could actually just say, well, we're gonna run the query that we ran before where Jane Austen is the source and we're looking for the target. We could run another query where we actually say, hey, uh, Jane Austen is the target, show me the source. That would get us back Henry James, cool. But that seems really kind of inefficient. So let's take another approach, given sort of all the mechanism that we now have under our belt. We can start with this very simple query, which says, for this object, Jane Austen, give me back all of her types. That is, all of the types that Jane Austen is using. And for every one of those types, go to the schema and tell me all of the properties that those types have. So we run this and we get back all of the properties for all of those types. Now, we can actually use that links property on property, and we can say, great, for all the uses of that property, show me where Jane Austen is the source, find me all of the targets. And that's essentially the same as our first reflect query. But we can extend this even further, and we can now reverse it. And we can say, look, for the use of, the, of this as the master property, which means going the other direction, um, I want to find all of the links for that property um, where we want the source and Jane Austen is the target. Cool, this gives us sort of full reflection. So now we have a way of actually picking up an object in the graph and knowing everything there is to know about that object. And so once you have this capability then, I think um, this really sort of suggests a new style of programming when you're thinking about working with Freebase data. And that is to act on the meaning that you get back from the objects in the graph. So the typical approach, the approach that we've been sort of playing out earlier in this talk was to say, well, we start with an object like Jane Austen, and we say, great, we know that she's a person and she has a place of birth, and then we go on and we say, great, we think that she has some languages, give us those languages, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we probably want, you know, she's an author, tell us about her books and things like that. And so great, we, you know, do some clever optimizations, we, I don't know, package these things up, we write a whole bunch of optional clauses, or we package these up in one nickel envelope to make the transport more efficient. But when we take that kind of rote approach, things go a little bit south when we actually have another person like Franz Liszt, right? Not an author, a composer, we probably wanna ask slightly different questions about him. How are we gonna do that? Well, if we go back and use our reflect capabilities, we can write a query essentially like this. We probably wanna expand it in some interesting ways, but this is the basic skeleton that you would be using. 
And now you're going to get back all of the things that are connected to that object, Franz Liszt. And we're gonna learn that he's a composer. And now, the trick is to say, can your application take the results of this query and respond to those in useful ways? So if I want to sort of respond to him as a person, I could write a bunch of functions that deal with the properties coming off of here as a person to represent him as a person. If I think that composers are important, I can go and add some more methods around composers to the system without ever having to change the query. And the important thing to understand is that Freebase is a very live community, right? The graph is continually changing. New connections are being made to objects. New types and new properties are coming into existence every day. And if you have to go in and actually modify the queries and modify the code that's digesting those queries and taking them apart and finding all the results, that's a lot of work. Much easier to write sort of a straightforward query that grabs all the information that it can and then sends it off for processing in the application so that you get some useful results back. So this is great. I think, you know, this, is, this really does suggest sort of this property-driven programming. I see the property, I respond to it, in which case my application has really become sort of semantically aware. That is, I'm responding to the meaning of these objects in interesting ways. But that's actually, I think, just sort of the first part of the story. Metaschema uh, is the idea that there are generalized relationships in Freebase. So for instance, if we think about Jane Austen and her relationship to Stubbington, we could sort of say, well, that's not just a place of birth, but that's in some sense the origin of Jane Austen. And similarly, we could look at her book, Pride and Prejudice, and we could say its place of first publication, that property, points to London, but we could also think of that as being the place of origin for the book. So now we have one property which actually describes two properties. And so if we actually respond to place of origin in some interesting way, now we actually have some leverage. We can actually group properties together, write a bunch of methods against uh, these, and we'll get sort of more power out of our application. One of the nice things about Metaschema is it actually isn't uh, just sort of single property relationships as well. In Freebase, when you represent uh, the relationship of an actor to the film, for instance, Colin Firth to the BBC miniseries uh, Pride and Prejudice, there's actually an intermediate node there which is the performance. And that performance is necessary because we need to be able to tell you that on that path between Pride and Prejudice and Colin Firth, he actually played a role of Darcy. And we need a place to actually hang that property and that's gonna come off of the performance. But in sort of a colloquial way, it would be nice to be able to say, oh, Colin Firth um, was an, an actor in Pride and Prejudice, as opposed to actually saying, well, he was in this performance and that performance uh, was for this movie. So one of the nice things is that Metaschema actually allows us to jump over relationships as well. So now we can actually have a has-contributor relationship between Colin Firth and uh, the BBC production of Pride and Prejudice. So we went through the whole graph and we looked at um, all of the properties in uh, Freebase Commons, and what we discovered was that about 3,500 of the properties actually fell into one of 46 patterns. And that, those 46 patterns package those 3,500 properties in interesting sort of um, stylistic patterns. And of course, what fun would this mapping of those 3,500 properties into 46 patterns be if we didn't actually go and represent that in the graph itself so that you could query it? So that mapping uh, into all of these properties into those patterns um, is actually represented in what we call this metaschema schema. Um, and it's actually very simple, I won't go into the details here, but the idea is that you can start with something like um, a property, film director film, and you can ask what it, the relationship is, what is the, the predicate, the type of relationship that it has. And we can actually use that little query snippet um, in our Jane Austen, uh, query about what properties are on these types, and we're gonna get back then all of the different patterns of the different properties that are on those types. So with Jane Austen, this isn't actually terribly interesting, right? I mean, what we really know about Jane Austen is that she was an author. 
yeah, that's great. I mean, very important author, and she's really fun to read. Um, but uh, she's not that challenging to actually represent. But when it comes to somebody like Robert Redford, things go a little bit weird, right? I mean, he's an actor, but we actually represent the fact that he's a film actor and a TV actor and a stage actor all separately. But yet, if our application is responding to meaning, it would be nice to actually group those things together. So we can play out that same query using Robert Redford, and what we discover is, in fact, we get a much fewer set of predicates than we do all the properties that uh, he is actually connected to. So we can actually add this little um, snippet into our reflection, and now when we look at the connections between Jane Austen and all of the other objects, we can get those relationships back now as meta schema, as one of these 46 patterns. So the idea here is really to reduce the number of properties that your program has to respond to, needs to understand in some sense. We said that Freebase is a really rich set of vocabulary, and that's absolutely true, but the question is, you know, would you really like to have to go and map all of those properties uh, into methods, or would you actually like to say, well, there are kind of these 46 patterns that I'm interested in, then there are some very specialized things that I want to do perhaps around people, um, or, you know, whatever it is that my domain of interest is, but the rest of them I can sort of group into these larger collections and respond to in aggregate. So, that was sort of a whirlwind tour through this. Um, what I wanted to do, since we have a little bit of time, uh, is to show you uh, a, a very bad application, and I would not suggest that um, this is a framework in any way. It's just an idea out there that you can sort of look at and try to understand what's going on. Um, so this not pretty application is designed for you to clone. Um, it is. I tried to be as bare bones uh, about things as possible so that you could actually see what was going on. Um, and so in this, oops, uh, I can ask for uh, Jane Austen. Oops, and I, hard, hard to see what's going on over there. There we go. And what I have is just uh, two methods in this application which are responding to um, the results of the reflect query. So this is a very bare bones template to display things. In fact, all of the juice is uh, in this um, one uh, function here, reflection. So I go to do reflect and look at this. And uh, this is just going through and actually running the reflect query and then dispatching into a bunch of functions that I've defined um, for the different properties that I get back. And I have a very minimal collection of these properties, uh, or these functions, so I have something for common topic alias. Um, you saw that with uh, George Washington. Uh, and I'm saying, if there's an image, uh, show us the image as well. Now, um, that wasn't too interesting for uh, Jane Austen, and let me show you uh, what happens if we do Ridley Scott? Um, here we see the alias and the images coming back. Again, not terribly exciting. Um, but if we wanted to do something more interesting for Ridley Scott, say, um, I could add a uh, function in which interprets the uh, relationship between a film director and his films. And so, I'll add this very simple one in. It just goes off and gets the picture of the film at the other end of the link. Go back and refresh. And now actually I'm interpreting all of the other, the query hasn't changed at all. Same information coming back. I'm just dispatching on another property. So this is great. I've got more information about the films that he's directed here. Um, but, uh, See, if I do Jane Austen again, just to sort of prove that I'm not doing anything too magical here. Um, this doesn't help Jane Austen at all, right? She's not a film director. Okay, so great. Let's actually go and turn this into uh, a bit of meta schema. So down here I've added a function for contributed to, um, which is one of the properties that I'll get back, uh, and then if I go, and it turns out that this reflect query and this meta reflect query are literally the same except for that one clause, but unfortunately I didn't want to try to edit it on the fly since I'm really bad at the keyboard. 
uh, and I will just change the query that I'm using to meta reflect. And now if we look at Jane Austen, we discover that she has contributed to a whole bunch of films. Um, she's credited as uh, the story writer for these films, not um, the screen writer, uh, as well as a whole bunch of information about um, books and things like that. Um, and if I go in and actually look at Ridley Scott again, what I get back is um, not only the films that he directed, but he also has produced a bunch of films and acted as, you know, ancillary um, personnel in films. And so we get a whole lot more uh, information about the films that he's worked on. And of course, if we were really clever, we could actually display the property that was contributing to this meta-schema relationship and things like that. But the idea is that this is a really simple pattern um, which takes that one query now and allows you to do a whole lot of stuff with it and allows you to sort of incrementally change your application uh, to respond to the data that's coming back. Um, so this is um, online, and if you go to the, um, there's, Uh, if you go to io2011, freebaseapps.com, um, all of the queries that I went through today are there, uh, as well as a link to that application which you can clone uh, and um, modify and play with yourself. Uh, and then there's information about Freebase documentation. All of the things that I've been telling you are in that documentation. And we have a very active developer community. Um, the Freebase mailing list, um, you can find out about it at list.freebase.com. So, I'm happy to entertain questions, comments. Happily, I, I left about as much time as I had hoped for. Maybe a silly 101 question, but uh, what's the relationship between the data that's in Freebase right now and, say, other s source data like Wikipedia or census data or stuff like that? Right. So um, Freebase is a superset of a lot of different data sets. Um, so we're continuously importing Wikipedia, uh, mostly for the topics themselves. Um, at, I'm not sure what the total article count in uh, Wikipedia is these days, but it's I believe well under four million. So given the 22 million that's in Freebase, um, it's a pretty you know, small section. It's an important section, um, but it's a, a, a subset of, um, we have other data sets like um, Music Brains is brought in um, for a lot of music data. It's augmented by a lot of other sources as well. So Freebase is really in some sense the melting pot for all of these different data sets. And one of the important things um, is you can think about Freebase as sort of the Rosetta Stone for navigating between these different data sets because all of their sort of internal identifiers are actually maintained with the Freebase topics so that you can actually use a Wikipedia uh, article name, come into Freebase and find the topic that that's associated with, and then jut out to another data source um, as well. So it's, that's one very important way of actually using Freebase. I'm curious uh, how and uh, if Mickle handles transitive uh -huh. predicates and uh, in terms of querying either n hops or uh, infinite hops from yeah, a so given we, topic. Mickle does not actually have any transitive operations, so it's okay. up to you to navigate those links yourself. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I know uh, Google just recently put a, a whole lot of the uh, U.S. Patent Office online. Is there any chance of getting this integrated? Uh, you know, I think it really depends on sort of the interest of the community. Um, but yes, we've actually, people have added um, patent models before um, in the hopes that we could actually do that type of thing. Um, I don't know of any current plans, but I think it's a pretty interesting idea. So my question um, centers around using Mikkel outside of Freebase. Um, obviously, it's a very expressive um, syntax, and it would be very good for other APIs. So my question is, do you have any advice on, um, is it very feasible um, to be able to um, incorporate the same syntax, and like, what's some good things to read? Uh, so this has actually come up on the mailing list uh, in the past. Uh, and um, we know of actually at least two other Mikkel implementations that are out there. Um, there is a geo data set and another knowledge base that is actually using essentially Mikkel syntax. In fact, 
um, the geo data set, um, their documentation just pointed to ours. Um, they had very specific things, but the actual Mikkel syntax and things like that, they wanted you to actually look at this sort of one source. Um, and we'd be, you know, very interested and excited to see other people adopting it. Um, I don't have anything specific to say about the implementation. I'm not sort of in that world. Um, but I know that, you know, there are actual papers that have been published on, like, GraphD, the underlying data store and things like that. So I'm sure if you ask, you know, hard questions that you might have on the mailing list, somebody would probably be interested in talking. Uh, hi, thanks for your presentation. Uh, so are there any uses of Freebase that are not permitted? Basically, uh, is there an open license? Uh, can Freebase be integrated into commercial applications? Are there different content licenses? Do people own what they put into Freebase, et cetera? Yeah, so you know? uh, that's a great question. Um, so everything that's in Freebase in the graph is available under a Creative Commons attribution license, and you're free to use that however you want in your own applications, commercial or otherwise. Um, the data, things like the images um, and some of the article descriptions are under uh, other open licenses, and you can actually get that information. Um, you need to make the proper attribution if you're using those things that are coming out of what we call the blob store. Um, but uh, there's also, uh, and I didn't put it up there, it's in the documentation, um, the uh, data dumps, which is a very popular way of consuming the data in mass uh, if you're going to do processing on it for different applications. So, um, those are being produced on a very regular basis, so you can actually look through the whole graph, extract the information that you're interested in, and use it uh, with the uh, proper attributions. Great. Well, I really appreciate uh, all of the questions and comments, and feel free to contact me if you have any further thoughts. Thank you.